got to the point where there wasn't anybody around, you know. Not only was there not anybody around, but they didn't want you around. You have no friends or family, you don't trust anybody. You, everything you have is in a backpack and on you. That's it. If you get a new set of pants, that means you gotta get rid of an old set. I've had people spit on me. I've had people dump water on me. I've had people completely ignore my presence. You know, I could walk up and say hi and somebody would just keep walking. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. I was by myself with five kids. And it, at that point, it felt like the end of the world. And I just felt like everything was caving in on me. Yeah, it got to the point where we couldn't pay bills no matter what we tried. And it just came to a boiling point with me and I felt like there was nothing to live for and attempted suicide. I was embarrassed. Um, I was also, um, I felt judged. If I'm going to the food bank and seeing everybody else the same as you, have nothing, nothing. And you're saving the plastic bags when you're done because you never know that might be your little umbrella over your head, you know? Nobody should ever have to feel what it's like to give up on themselves. After the whole world's given up on you. Across America, approximately 550,000 people are homeless. Every city has been deeply affected, including Spokane. You find them under bushes, behind dumpsters, what have you, and to me, that's just a horrible way to live. Nobody should have to live that way. The most recent one-day count found that Spokane has roughly 1,100 homeless living on the streets or in shelters, up 11% from 2016. But. This number does not include the large number of hidden homeless, mostly families with children living in cars, RVs, sheds, or doubling up with other families. A lot of times the families are in the shadows. There's a huge amount of homelessness in our community. Spokane County reported over 3,000 homeless students in the public school system in 2016. You know, keep in mind, Spokane, we're, we're the poorest region in the state of Washington. The poorest city in the entire state is Chihuahua, just north of here. Uh, we have a lot of poor people. One in four in Spokane are living under the poverty line. That's much higher than the national average or the state average. So we have a lot of people who are struggling here. Homelessness has costs throughout our community, in our health care system, in our public safety system, and just the human cost of homelessness. So this is a huge problem. It's about, about three years ago is when we lost the house. And, uh, you know, been homeless ever since, just trying to survive. Uh, living out of our truck, hotels, you know, whatever we can to stay warm. Who are the homeless? Where do they come from? Why are they here? We ask everybody two questions. Where were you born and how long you've been in Spokane? And what we find is 80% of our folks were born within 30 miles of Spokane. These are our people. They're our homeless. They're not someone else's homeless. And if they weren't born here, they've probably been here for five or ten years. The homeless are our community. This is a piece of us, it's a part of us, it's our neighbor, it's the person we ride the bus with. And, that, and it can happen to anybody and everybody. And people just don't want to realize that. Well, I'd never do that, I'd never become homeless. There isn't a one of us that cannot become homeless. You lose your job, you have a death in the family, you get divorced all of a sudden, you, whatever the rhyme or reason may be, there is not a one of us that cannot become homeless. I never thought that I would end up being one of the homeless people. I, I just, I, I never did. It's like, you know, you're at home with your families and everything's going normal and then all of a sudden something happens and you and your family are out on the streets. I mean, it, it's flabbergasting. It, it's scary how quickly things happen. If you leave your wallet out, it will be gone in the morning. If you take your shoes off, they will be gone in the morning. You know, I mean, I double tie my laces. You know, I'd cinch them down at night, and I'd put, until the, the bow tie didn't have any left. Why? Well, hopefully it took them that much effort that I'd wake up so they didn't take my shoes. You know, I didn't know where to go, what to do. I knew 
no resources. I didn't know food banks or where to get food. It's like completely scary. Every day, a team of Spokane police officers make their morning rounds under overpasses and behind dumpsters, waking up the homeless and moving so them can't have you sleeping down here. Plus Many part of they the, know the by name. Well, as we're doing our daily patrols, we're interacting with them, checking on them, reach, offering them services. By design, the downtown precinct is located at the heart of the highest concentration of the chronically homeless in Spokane. Some have been homeless their entire life from when they were teenagers and they left the house and have always been homeless. Others have fallen on hard times. Um, lots uh, of the homeless that we see uh, have addiction or substance abuse issues. Some are fleeing violence and there was a factor of, of mental illness. All those kind of added up to put them on the street. Policing the homeless has changed dramatically over the last five years. Um, it used to be you'd drive by and you'd see a homeless person and you, you didn't have any options for them. Yeah, there was a mission, but they didn't have a program to get them back into the workforce or to get them into stable housing. Now, the police have more options. So you can just pick up the phone and call somebody and help them get into whatever their need is, help that need get met. And so that's been really the, the difference in why this program has been successful, is because the community has come together to address this issue. It's uh, sometimes labeled as touchy-feely or a little, you know, outside of the norm of police work, but it's absolutely police work. It's part of Spokane's five-year strategic plan to end homelessness. We need to as a community, as business partners, as government, as philanthropic and nonprofits come together and, and really get an answer in the many different populations of people that experience homelessness. Homelessness can be chaotic, messy, and dangerous. It's especially challenging for businesses located in the heart of it. And you have folks, you know, uh, literally like laying down in front of people's uh, entryways to their business, alongside their buildings, uh, in their alleyways, in their parking lots. And you have, um, you know, a lot of a lot of litter and garbage. You have public urination and defecation. I mean, uh, you have uh, folks that are on drugs and alcohol to people that are suffering from mental illness. And can be frightening to customers and to business owners and their employees. It's a balancing act for police and everyone involved. Uh, it is really challenging to have a vibrant core when people are suffering on the streets. And we want to make sure that our strategies uh, to address that, that human suffering uh, are compassionate to the individual experience. And we recognize that we have to also do uh, some work to support the surrounding businesses. Even though Spokane has sit in lie laws, the homeless are rarely arrested. Most of these cases, the old way wasn't working. You can't arrest yourself out of all the problems that, that we dealt with, and a lot of the crimes we were dealing with downtown were low-level misdemeanors. Instead of jail, the police now have another option, community court. Newton Bohannon Jr. and Nez Perce started drinking on the reservation when he was 12 years old. You know, there's times I'd wake up and I'd be in a mud puddle or I'd, you know, urinate on myself and vomit and still get up and walk around like nothing happened. And I was just becoming a, a product of the streets. Newton spent years living on the streets, homeless and intoxicated. Well, my living room is Sprague and Stevens and my bedroom is the underpass. Like many homeless people, Newton had been in and out of jail many times for crimes like trespassing, drinking, panhandling, and public urination. The drinking, I always, it was like always in my hip pocket. It was always like an old friend. In 2016, Newton was arrested again. He thought he was facing more jail time. But this time, his case was sent to Spokane's new experimental community court.
Every Monday, the meeting rooms of the downtown library are transformed into a courtroom and resource center. Neutral territory, that was exactly what the message was behind this. You know, nothing bad happens in the library. This courtroom is different from the ones across the river. Community court is a problem-solving court. It's designed to solve problems. In a traditional court, repeat offenders often spend a life sentence in jail, 30, 60, 90 days at a time. And jail time is expensive, $130 a day. So as a traditional prosecutor, I was a prosecutor's prosecutor. I chased felons out of the courtroom with warrants. I would ask for jail in 30, 60, 90 day increments. I became disillusioned with that because I would see the same people over and over again coming through the system with no credible change. They were still homeless, they were still underneath the freeway trespassing. It caused me to start reevaluating what I was doing as a prosecutor. Instead of emphasizing an endless cycle of short-term jail sentences, community court provides defendants a way to get help with their problems under an intense six-month supervision plan. It gave them an opportunity for us to be able to bring resources to help them solve the fundamental core of the problem that led them to jail in the first place, that led them to the crime. Because if you don't take care of the root cause of the problem, you keep treating the wound, is going to fester. In community court, the defendant must agree to a strict contract with the court or go to jail. The agreement includes such things as committing no new crimes, connecting with the social services they need, showing up every Monday for a progress report, and performing community service. If the defendant sticks to their agreement for six months, their case will be dismissed. It's going to be okay. Okay, you're going to pull through. Community court is not business as usual. In community court, I'm a part of the process. The judge is really a component, as opposed to just sitting back in judgment. The judge, prosecutor, and public defender work together as a team, sharing personal information that normally only the public defender has access to. It lightens my burden, frankly, in sentencing or in dealing with someone by having information. And plus, it helps me understand better what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis for this person. I started looking at my job differently and looking at solutions rather than punishment. I've moved from a punitive type prosecutor to one who provides accountability with help. Early results are encouraging. Newton, now sober, recently graduated from community court. And there's individuals that, man, I would have never thought in a million years they would have changed their behavior, and they have. Newton is one guy. I mean, for the life that he's had, for him to make that 180 change, man, that's nothing short of a miracle. That night, it was 17 degrees, and I had the one pair of pants, I had the, the one coat, and then about, I'm gonna guess somewhere around midnight to 2 a.m. is when it really hit in, how cold it was. And I remember uh, putting life preservers on. I remember wrapping up in life preservers, and then pulling them all out of the storage department and, and laying them over me, so I could hopefully hold some of the heat in. You can die in this type of weather. I mean, 17 degrees, you can die in that. They're all different snowflakes. Bob Peeler, a homeless advocate at SNAP, has enormous respect for the homeless. If you talk to them and you listen to their stories, they're amazing. They're survivors. They, they're things that I couldn't do. When it's like four below, they're in their camps. Peeler has been reaching out to the homeless for 35 years. I go into campsites, I go into the shelters, people on the street, and uh, talk to them. Find out how they're doing, how I can help them, are they ready to come in. Peeler approaches each campsite like it was their home. I knock, I make a knocking noise, ask if I can come in, ask if I can talk to them. It's their house, even if it's under a bridge or something. You treat them with respect, as I would like to be treated if someone came to my house. 
building trust is an important first step to getting a person help. I might talk to a guy six times before I know his real name. I believe that we all get do-overs. So when somebody's in the midst of a crisis, let's make it a do-over. Learn from it and get reestablished. Go in and have a seat for me. Okay. Okay. Hi, guys. This takes around a long time. Yes. Remind me of the same thing. Today is a drop-in day at SNAP. The homeless are lined up halfway down the block. It's first come, first serve. Many wait hours, desperate to get some help. It's really designed to help the most vulnerable, literally homeless people in town. People from all walks of life are homeless. We had a lady that had worked at a college for 22 years, got breast cancer, couldn't do her job anymore. Unemployment ran out, she had no medical, and now she sleeps in her car. And I'm trying to get her housing. Many national best practices have been adopted in Spokane, saving money and resources. In the last few years here in Spokane, we have started um, what's called coordinated entry systems, and those are designed so that people don't have to go agency shopping and hopping around and filling out paperwork at every agency hoping that something comes around. And so they go to one agency. SNAP is the coordinated entry point for homeless individuals and couples without children. Catholic Charities is the location for homeless families. Upon entry, an individual or family undergoes an assessment, measuring their vulnerability. But some homeless can fall through the cracks. We've been trying to go f to different places to get help. And no matter where we go, they tell us we can't help us because for what we don't have kids. We don't do drugs, and we don't drink. So we don't need rehab for anything, we don't, you know, need any kind of resources for that. So it leaves us out there thinking, well, what do we do? People who have lived on the streets for many years have priority. And it's a prioritized system, so those with the highest needs are prioritized for services first. But sometimes, the most vulnerable are afraid to get help. I talk about what if. How would it be if you had your own place, you could have your couch, you can make your place into your own back cave. That last Pepsi's in the refrigerator is yours. You can leave five dollars to change on the counter and know it's going to be there. And that's what we're talking about. How would that be? To give them some kind of hope that someone cares and someone will take your hand and give you a hand up. I think that's the most important thing. Because if people have no one on their side or know what to do, they're lost. They're, they're lost somewhere until someone gives them a chance. Okay. Feel better? Nice to meet you. I grew up in child abuse. I was 15. My mom, 15, my mom tried to kill me. She choked me out until I stopped breathing. I've been raped once. I got jumped in a park by two dudes. I can't sleep at night anyway. I have night terrors. Honestly, I don't look in the future. At 6 p.m., the homeless check in to the House of Charity Emergency Shelter. Anyone in any condition can come, have access to a safe place to sleep, two meals a day. HOC is usually a shelter for only men, with 109 beds upstairs with lockers and showers. But this last winter, the facility opened up as a 24-7 emergency shelter for the first time, allowing both women and pets to stay there. We have dogs and cats. We had an iguana at one point. And so, I mean, the basic rule is if you can be respectful and your animal can be respectful, then you're welcome to be at the House of Charities. At night, the dinner tables are pushed aside, making room for an overflow sleeping area. 200 additional homeless will sleep side by side on mats on the floor. The community did not know that there were this many individuals experiencing homelessness. I mean, the city didn't know, we didn't know, 
In the first quarter, we slept 1,575 unduplicated men and 300 unduplicated women in the first quarter. So these numbers were beyond what we knew or expected. Every time the bell rings at the House of Charity, another homeless person gets housing. It's been ringing a lot lately. Catholic Charities' Rob McCann believes street homelessness can end someday. In Spokane, I look at homelessness, and it truly is something that's solvable. Uh, and you can't say that in a lot of big cities in our country. We have a unique situation in Spokane in that we think we can solve it. Under McCann's leadership, Catholic Charities has an ambitious long-term plan to end street homelessness. Using federal tax credits, Catholic Charities has been building permanent supportive housing for the homeless, six buildings in all. We want to make this place empty. Uh, we want to build a permanently supported housing apartment for every chronically homeless man and woman in Spokane. And it's not a pipe dream, it's not a prayer, it's not a wish. Not only can we do it, we are doing it right now. It's part of a new radical approach called Housing First. It's a complete turnaround for social services. Instead of requiring the homeless to be stable before they get housing, now the idea is to get people into housing first and then provide the services needed no matter what their condition. Even McCann didn't know if it would work at first. And I can tell you that if you had asked me 15 years ago, Rob, would you walk up to a chronically homeless guy living under the Monroe Street Bridge and say, here's your key to your new apartment. You can move in today. You can live there forever. It's permanent. And your rent will be basically $0 a month. I would have told you, that's crazy. You can't do that. You got to get people stabilized, clean and sober and back on their meds for mental health before you move them into that apartment. That's 15 year ago, Rob. We've now changed our minds completely, and now we think that that's the only way to do it. Housing First has been a blessing for people like Volando Peoples. Volando never thought he'd have his own home, or any home for that matter. He grew up on the poor side of Chicago, surrounded by gangs and violence. Housing First changed his life. After years of bouncing from one shelter to another, he finally has a place to call home. When they first started building this, I used to walk up here all the time and say, man, it's gonna be nice living over there. I'm still pinching myself sometimes. Volando's new apartment at Booterhaven is a 50-unit complex that provides permanent supportive housing to the most vulnerable in our community. We saw a dramatic reduction in the cost uh, to those individuals as we work with them on addressing addiction issues and mental health issues. At the forefront of their mind isn't, where am I sleeping tonight? And it's very difficult as you look at the hierarchy of needs that if, if someone doesn't know where they're sleeping to address issues of addiction or lifelong uh, mental health issues, uh, you, you can't break those barriers unless uh, they have an understanding uh, that they're going to be safe that night. I was roaming the streets. I would sometimes sleep in a parking lot, underneath a truck, in some bushes. It gave me this identity that I was less than, that I belong in the sewers, that I'm, sub I'm a subhuman being, that I don't fit in this society. I've had a lot of smart people tell me I was worthless. Homelessness is very expensive. The toll of homelessness on the individual is high enough, but there's also the toll on city services. They can spend anywhere from $50,000 to $200,000 per year per person on police, fire, ambulance, ER, hospital, jail, social service costs, court costs, all of it. 5% of the patients account for 25% of all emergency room visits in the U.S. They're known as super utilizers in the emergency medical system. Most of them are homeless. 
we saw the same people over and over in the ER that had really, really high needs. These people had really fallen down and were really living at rock bottom. They're usually folks that are struggling with more than one disorder, whether it's a substance abuse or dependence disorder combined with a mental illness, combined with medical problems, combined with poverty. Essentially, if you call more than 18 times a year, you're considered a, a super user. You can imagine the frustration of having to respond over and over and over to Mrs. Smith, not because you're responding to help them, but because nobody's doing anything about it. To address this problem, emergency responders and service providers got together and formed the Spokane Hotspotters. The Hotspotters work together as a team, surrounding a super utilizer with the services and care they need while working to reduce costs was truly magical because we were we were changing people's lives with resources that had always existed but were previously siloed. We discuss a case and then the respective uh, disciplines start throwing out solutions. To help the homeless recover after surgery, some shelters have started respite programs. The average homeless person, I think, is in the hospital like seven nights, and the average person like you or I is in the hospital like 1.6 nights. They don't send them home because they know they're going to go to the street. They keep them in the hospital an extra five or six nights, uh, and that's $3,200 a night. And so we decided, what if we were to make four of these beds respite beds, and we'll keep them empty, and anytime the hospital needs to discharge a homeless person, they'll send them here. We'll have a nurse on site. We'll have special meals and case management, and we'll let them recover here. And so we tried it with four beds. The first year, those four beds, I think, saved Providence $3 million. So they, the next year, they said, hey, can we have 20 beds? And we said, sure. Drugs. I was in the meth real bad. And then after I got out of jail, where I was staying at, they wouldn't let me live there no more. So I ended on the streets and my lawyers is the one that told me about Hope House. Jennifer K. Okay. Cindy A. Okay. Nicole. Hope House is a women's emergency shelter run by Volunteers of America. Every afternoon, women wait outside hoping to get a bed for the night. I see women on a weekly basis that come to the door that are beat up, they've been raped because they're out on the street, there's no place for them to go. It's very unsafe out there. The 36 beds at Hope House fill up quickly. Every night, women are turned away. It's very dangerous out there. A woman that's homeless in Spokane, uh, statistics show that she'll probably be raped at least twice a year. There's something that uniquely happens when you're a homeless woman, and that's be you become invisible. And that's because it's safer. Hope House offers women security, even if it is just for one night. What I hear a lot from the women that come here is that this is their hope. They know that this is their safe place. When you walk in, the door locks behind you and nothing from the outside is coming in. At Hope House, the women's ages range from 18 to 92, from all walks of life. We've had and do have very, very productive women in this shelter. We're talking teachers, lawyers. The oldest woman we ever had here was 92 years old, and she was a psychiatrist for 50 years. You know, so 50 years of her life, she was helping someone else just to end up homeless and 92 years old. The morning comes early at Hope House. The women are required to pack up and leave by 8 a.m. Everything they own, they carry on their back. But if you can imagine having to carry all of your belongings every day on your back, I mean, that is a desperate situation. I mean, every night we turn away multiple women. And so that, that's the, the desperate part for us, is that we're just trying to meet the need in Spokane, and there's no way that we can keep up.
what are the coping skills um, that we are developing to help us manage those emotions? During the day, many of the women go to the Women's Hearth Day Shelter run by Transitions. But it really started from one holy name sister who was a little bit of a rebel herself. And I'm sure much to the chagrin of her fellow sisters decided to just start walking through downtown Spokane and asking the women that she met what they needed. The sister used the information to design a program specifically for homeless women. As she would ask women, they would say they needed a place to take a shower. They needed a place where they could just sit down and have a cup of coffee. They needed a place where they could feel safe, where there were no men who were potential abusers. And so she put together kind of this model that became the Women's Hearth. The Women's Hearth serves about 1,400 women each year, about 100 drop in every day. 60% of the women are homeless. And what really makes it special is a focus on not just the basic needs to live, but community, and helping women find a sense of belonging and a sense of a deeper fullness of their life. They need hobbies, they need friends, they need interests, and we try to provide opportunities for all of that. Isolation is one of the least understood aspects of homelessness. You don't have friends to go over their house and have dinner with. You don't have a place where you can invite someone over. You don't have the opportunity to just sit down and share a cup of coffee with someone because you have nowhere to go and you don't have the dollar to buy the coffee. And one of the real healing aspects of our services is a sense of belonging. And there's no way to measure that. There's no dollar amount we need to achieve that. But the difference in anyone's life when they know they have friends and they have people who care and love them, I mean, it's just not measurable. The house we're in uh, got sold. You know, we've stayed in motels. You know, we thought, oh, we'll just stay there for a couple of weeks, then we get paid, we can get a place, everything will be okay, and then just started going downhill. I made the decision to get away from a really, really bad situation and I found myself and my children living in my vehicle, actually sleeping outside. We ran out of money and stayed all night in Denny's. I think I've probably cried more than I ever thought possible. It, it's hard, you know, having my 12-year-old out here and Pop, you know, he's almost 80. I thought I was going to be afraid of people trying to hurt us and people messing with my little sister and my little brother and stuff like that, but no, I was more afraid of the fact that we possibly could be homeless forever. One of the things that's surprising about homelessness in Spokane is 31% of our homeless are children. And that's not what you see standing under the bridge with the sign or standing at the, the freeway entrance. For six months, the Arsenault family of four have been homeless. The construction economy collapsed in Florida. It kind of stuck me without a job. I got laid off. I took all my savings, my 401k and everything, kept trying to pay the bills. We're working minimum wage jobs. Uh, just couldn't keep a hold of it and lost everything. The family found themselves sleeping outside in a field behind an apartment complex. When a family becomes homeless, it's, it's kind of a domino effect. You know, it, it starts with the car breaks down and you don't have money to fix that. And so you have to try to get a ride to work and you show up work late too many times and you lose your job. And then you lose your job, but then you don't have money to pay rent. And then you don't have money to pay rent, you lose your housing. And so all of those things kind of domino into each other. The Arsenaults found help at Open Doors, an emergency family day shelter operated by Family Promise. These families are desperate. If you're showing up at a homeless shelter with your kids, we're, we're the last line of defense between not being in the street. It's an intense situation. Families are stressed, particularly when they first show up. Open Doors is designed around a homeless nine-year-old. It looks like a home. You know, there's a living room for kids and a place to play. And so it makes the environment uh, really designed around that child, which then by 
creating that environment, we put them at ease, which puts their parents at ease. And then we can actually spend a, a good deal of time working with the parents to get back onto their feet. The shelter is crowded with many families using the same communal space. Privacy is non-existent. And it's really hard because you got thousands of eyes, thousands of ears on you 24 seven. At night, the families bag up all their belongings and are bused to the Salvation Army to sleep. So you gotta rush around to gather up, you know, your night clothes, the clothes for the next morning. And you got all these bags on top of everything. So, I mean, and it's just constant chaos. At the Salvation Army, the families sleep side by side, in the same room, on the floor. The night shelter, we're all packed into a little room, you know, like a can of sardines, and we're given a, a little thin mat, but it's a lot better than sleeping outside. The lack of privacy is a big issue. I mean, it affects every, every aspect of a person's life. We don't even wear PJs anymore. Yeah. We put our clothes on that night that we're gonna wear the next day, all four of us. We're not drug addicts. We're not here because I'm an alcoholic. We've never had domestic violence issues. I mean, it's just, it's, it's circumstances that it just led us here. We, you know, we're a hardworking American family. Here we are, and most of, most of the families in here are hardworking American families. In 2017, over 3,000 students were homeless in Spokane County. They're called the hidden homeless, families living in the shadows. We just have this huge group and it's not often recognized. We in the schools see homeless um, differently than other organizations do. Our numbers are include families who are sharing the housing of others or um, couch surfing. By law, students experiencing homelessness have certain rights and protections. The HEART program was formed to ensure that. So if they're missing their birth certificate or if you don't have your immunizations up to date, then we can still enroll you in school and we'll work with you to get that correct paperwork in place. Providing transportation to make sure kids can get to and from their school and when they're moving from place to place to place to place, that school doesn't have to change from school to school to school to school with them. The goal of the law is to keep kids in those schools so that they have that educational continuity and can maintain those relationships. Homelessness puts students at risk for falling behind. Children automatically, if they spend one day of homelessness, they are put into an at-risk category within the school system. Um, because of their higher risk of, of dropping out. Absenteeism is a high indicator of whether a homeless student will graduate on time or at all. So we developed as a, as a system, an early warning system, so that schools could look at their data and say, well, here are some students that are showing indicators and we need to intervene now. I was living in my van for almost three months with my children. In three months, I mean, it doesn't seem like that long, but when you are in that situation with kids, it um, felt like a lifetime. A year ago, Connie Osman and her five children fled an abusive relationship. The man that I was involved with had got into some drugs and he became a very violent person, physical violent with me. He started hurting my mother. There was this one night I can remember. I thought he was going to kill my mom. I made the decision to uproot my children and myself and get away from a really, really bad situation. Leaving everything behind, the Osmonds ended up in Spokane, broke and homeless. I found myself and my children living in my vehicle, actually sleeping outside. And I remember sitting there that night and praying and 
asking for help. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. I was by myself with five kids. And it, at that point, it felt like the end of the world. And I just felt like everything was caving in on me. Domestic violence and drug addiction are two leading causes of homelessness. We were so vulnerable and I was terrified. I was so scared of what the possibility of what could happen to us and what could happen to my children. For the Osmonds, the Salvation Army was a godsend. When we walked into the Salvation Army, I mean, we walked in here just pitiful, dirty, hungry, very hungry, and cold, and just ready for a fresh start. With help, Connie got back on her feet. They give you the tools that you need to succeed. Every day was a struggle, but every day was also one step closer to being that successful parent that my kids needed. I'm so thankful for the Salvation Army. I'm so thankful for what they taught me. I am extremely thankful for the hope that they gave my family. It was like being in an empty, dark room trying to grasp onto anything solid. There was no safe place, and the objects I was reaching for seemed scary or sharp. This is Sarah McGrew. At 20, she found herself homeless with three small children. I was watching other women in my situation and struggling. I would watch friends go to jail. Um, I'd watch people on drugs. I would um, watch people, women doing things that they wouldn't typically do out of desperation. And I could see it was breaking them down and I was in fear that that was um, <clears throat> where I would be. Sarah grew up poor in an unstable home. As a teenager, she made a series of bad choices with men and drugs not understanding why I was making certain choices. I just accepted, I, I didn't understand um, a different way of life. And ultimately that led to homelessness. Sarah heard about St. Margaret's Family Shelter and called. Oh, St. Margaret's did so much for me. I was in just disbelief that there was such a resource. I almost wanted to pinch myself. I knew right away that I was where I needed to be. It's traumatic to be homeless. It's very traumatic to you know, be relocated to a shelter. The idea of a shelter is very scary for families. So part of it is you're working with families that are feeling very scared. Sarah began to heal at St. Margaret's. She got a job cleaning houses. And for me, cleaning gave me, it, it, it was um, almost a repeated pattern of what I was doing in my life here at St. Margaret's, of rebuilding myself, cleansing myself of things, finding goals, accomplishing them, taking that big, large thing and putting it into little increments and then seeing the results. Sarah eventually went back to school and started her own cleaning company. She now gives back by hiring other homeless women to work for her. I, I know what it's like to feel alone, to feel isolated, to feel hopeless, but I also know what it's like to overcome. We see it in each other, and they receive a empowerment or a hope in that in, it, in itself. I hated everything. I hated everybody. I hated myself. I was a suicidal wreck. Um, I couldn't go a day without dope. You know, as I wasn't okay. I still don't trust the world. Not with a single ounce of who I am, I don't trust the world. I trust the people that I know to trust. The people that never looked at me sideways, that never thought I was less than them. That's who I trust. Camille was 14 years old when her 22-year-old boyfriend convinced her to leave home. I was missing. I was on two different international missing persons lists for almost a year. Her boyfriend got her hooked on drugs. He got me into drugs and um, it was a very abusive relationship. I was essentially prostituted. 
I don't even remember how I got back to Spokane. I don't remember the weeks after getting back here. I don't, I don't know. Camille tried to reconnect with her family. I guess I just didn't fit in after that. You know, I couldn't go home. I tried going home, but it just didn't work. I didn't connect with my family anymore. My family didn't understand me. I was the first person in my family to ever even use hard drugs. So at 15, Camille found herself living on the streets of Spokane. For protection, she hooked up with a street family. You know, somebody that's got your back, and that's how it is with street kids. You know, you look at one of us, you're looking at all of us as a whole. When kids have lived the life on the streets, they become very accustomed to the street culture. That is also a major barrier that is really hard to break down because the street culture is a culture all of its own. They're used to having people around them all the time. So then when you put them somewhere where they don't have that, it's really hard for them to thrive. Most of society will say these kids choose to be homeless and that is so far from wrong. Um, these kids have been through some absolute horrendous life experiences. Um, many of them are things that as adults we couldn't fathom. Street kids like Camille find help at Crosswalk, a teen shelter for 13 to 18 year olds. I think the biggest thing is really just teaching them that they're homeless, not hopeless. You know, a lot of times they've been tossed to the side by everybody they've known. Every mistake they've made, somebody else turns them away. So it's really building that relationship so that they know they can make mistakes, they can yell at me, they can, you know, not do what they need to be doing, and I'm still going to be there tomorrow, and my staff is still going to be there tomorrow. At Crosswalk, the kids can get their GED, have a meal, get some advice, or spend the night. They are free to come and go. It was safe. That's really the only way I can explain it. It was safe. I knew that I could show up here at any point in time and they would let me in. The only way I can put it is this is home. I mean, I've even aged out, but this is still home. At 21, Camille is stable, has her own place, and is working. But at times, it's still difficult. After you go through that at 14, 15 years old, you don't feel okay ever again. <laughs> I still have nights where I don't feel okay. And I demised myself and, and fell back in the same trap of addiction. And uh, that's what basically entails my whole life, you know, the last 25 years of it, you know. And like I said, 9,125 days of a fight that I could never win. There's no winning in that fight. And every day I showed up, every day I showed up for the fight and every day I lost. Every time I heard a siren, I would think, is that Derek? Are they going to pick Derek up? And then an ambulance. And every time I, I hear something happen, they found somebody, I'd say, oh, is that him? Derek Mobley grew up in San Francisco. He started dealing drugs in junior high school. I never had a father in my life. So the streets became my father and I idolized pimps and drug dealers and players because as a kid, that's all we saw. Things went from bad to worse for Derek. He became addicted to cocaine and alcohol. Eventually, he ended up in prison. I did what came natural, drugs and alcohol. Only thing I knew at the time, you know. Worried, Derek's friends sent him to the Union Gospel Mission in Spokane for help. They enrolled him in UGM's two-year drug and alcohol recovery program. UGM's faith-based, no-holds-barred approach started to work for Derek. Hearing your secrets said out loud back to you, hearing your, uh, your shortcomings and not being able to run from it or ignore it or get angry at it. I need to work on that. That, that, that is so huge and big for uh, an addict alcoholic to say that. Addiction is one of the leading causes of homelessness. 
Most of the people that we have coming into our program, they're, they're homeless, they're in the what we call the rescue part of the mission. Their addiction has beat them, they don't know how to deal with it. People like Guadalupe Granados, whose addiction consumed him. I just couldn't stop drinking. I just wanted to drink because drinking was the only thing that made me feel good. Um, I could just forget about my problems, and but I started drinking at work. Before long, Guadalupe was fired and soon homeless, and remained that way for the next three years. I was roaming the streets. I would sometimes sleep in the parking lot, underneath a truck, in some bushes. Most of our clients have had some pretty severe trauma in their childhood. Their drug addiction is the solution to them because one of the big problems is this trauma down there that's never been dealt with and trauma stays with us throughout our lives unless we're able to process it. So a lot of our clients, um, it's, you know, the addiction is the tip of the iceberg and the trauma is probably the bulk of the iceberg down there. Guadalupe turned to the Union Gospel Mission for help. I had nowhere else to go. Everyone I knew was toxic, and this was as safe as it can get. UGM has been working with the homeless for decades. If you look at the old pictures from the mission back in the 50s and 60s, average age of a person back then was 40s, 50s. The reason for their addiction was alcohol. That was about the only drug that was really causing addiction back then. And so it takes an alcoholic usually a fair amount of time to get to that point where the addiction is knocked him down to the point of homelessness. Now you walk in here, or you take a look at our guys in the program, and you're gonna see the average age is probably 28 to 35, a lot of them in their mid-20s. And the reason is the drugs have changed. We still have alcohol as a huge culprit, but meth and cocaine, especially meth, because it's cheap. He gets addicted maybe at 20, a couple times he's used and he is already addicted. He's hit bottom by the time he's 25. He knows he's got to do something or that addiction is going to kill him. It's taught me how to, uh, how to cope with problems. I had to forgive myself and forgive the people who, who I felt were responsible for making me this way. The formerly incarcerated often end up homeless, living on the streets. Jobs and housing for a felon is practically non-existent. Because once you're incarcerated and you have that felon stigma on you, it's gonna follow you for the rest of your life. The rules of the society say that when you, when you do your time, you're good to go. You've, you've followed what the guidelines were for the justice system, that now you're out, you're free, you can do your life. Well, that's not true. It's just like, it's just like wearing a badge like the Scarlet, you know what I mean? But it's gonna be an F for felon. Lane Pavey was released from prison in 2011 after serving 20 months. It wasn't until I got out and started facing all these barriers that, you know, I was realizing like, you, you didn't just serve 20 months, you're serving life. Lane was hoping to move forward with her life and leave this part behind. And I found out that that wasn't really how it works when you have a criminal record in society. Lane couldn't find housing or a job. The day you get out, you know, you're, you're excited to move on with your life. I had a degree already. Um, I'd, I'd sold real estate for about three years. Um, I thought it, it was going to be easy, and I kept finding this box on these job applications that asked me to check if I had a felony conviction. Still to this day, six years later, I've never gotten past a box on a job application. The biggest barrier we have is a box, and what that box is, it's on every application, whether it be like rental agreements, uh, applications for work, it's a stigma that keeps continually holding us down. Even without a criminal history, affordable housing is hard to find in Spokane. There is a less than 1% vacancy rate. If you have any 
you know, trouble with uh, evictions in the past or criminal history or uh, anything that doesn't look right on job history, um, you're going to have trouble getting housing and keeping housing. Uh, what you find is that people can become chronically homeless pretty quickly and can every time they're striving to get out of that chronic homeless cycle, um, they are met with another denial letter from a landlord. Lane started a program called Revive Reentry Services. With lots of hands-on support, Revive manages five houses who rent rooms to the formerly incarcerated. I've been given a big opportunity here and I, I'm trying to take advantage of it, you know, so. I'm getting some um, accountability you know, some self-respect, um, some pride back, um, and some morals. Fighting homelessness is a marathon, not a sprint. Some of the steps that, that we're taking today, we're really looking for that next generation. Major results may not be seen for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. To me, it's very encouraging to know that um, we're on that forefront of always shaping and evolving things to really get that, to end that homelessness. That's our goal. We, you know, we want to put ourselves out of a job. We want to end homelessness. We want to not have shelters anymore. Staying at home and hoping that something uh, is going to be fixed isn't really a strategy. You know, it, it's just, we need something sustainable, something that's long-term and something that, that treats human beings like the way we would expect all human beings to be treated. This program is available on DVD. To order, visit ksps.org or call 1-800-735-2377. For more on the organizations serving Spokane's homeless and how to get involved, visit SpokaneCares.org.